welcome back to my channel. I want to firstly apologize for any loud, weird banging noises you might hear. They are doing some sort of work upstairs in the apartment above me, and this is my only time to film. I'm hoping, hoping it stops soon, but if it doesn't, don't be alarmed. It is just some sort of insane demolition going on upstairs. And second of all, I wanted to update you guys on how much money we have raised so far for the families of Enrique Rios, Elijah Moore, and Evie Stepik. If you guys aren't aware, in my last video for Evie Stepik, I announced that I would be launching limited edition merchandise through teespring.com. This merchandise was to celebrate 100,000 subscribers. I had originally had a really large plan that kind of fell through the cracks for the moment. So instead Instead, I decided to come up with a design that encompassed me, you guys, and the people that we cover and would also benefit these people that we cover as well. So I came up with this design right here and I will only be selling them through a Tuesday and all proceeds will go directly to the GoFundMe accounts of Evie Stepik, Enrique, and Elijah. So far, we have raised $1,285. I had no idea how this was gonna go, and you guys have blown it out of the water. I personally cannot wait to get my items. I hope you guys are excited to get yours. Don't forget, once you get them, to go ahead and send me some pictures of them. I really hope that this money will benefit these investigations in one way or another, and I know you guys always ask all the time if there's something more we can do, and I figured, this was just a great way to start off the new year. But that is enough of my rambling. We are going to go ahead and get right into the case of Enrique Rios and Elijah Moore. I have known about this case for a very, very long time and have been following it because the story is just very bizarre. I normally don't clump people together when I do missing persons cases, but it is very important to me that these two have the same video because the FBI now considers them as being connected. So we'll start off with Enrique Rios because he was the first one to go missing. Enrique was 16 years old the last time he was seen, which was by his mother at 9 p.m. on October the 16th, 2016. His mother says that she was just going about their normal nighttime routine and she went in to say goodnight to him like she did every other night before she went to bed. She said he appeared completely normal. He was wearing just a thin t-shirt and shorts, which to her indicated that he was planning to go to bed as well. There was school the next day, so she said goodnight, assumed that's where he was headed and went off to bed. But when she woke up the next morning, Enrique was not in his room. Before I go any further, I want to kind of tell you guys how these boys knew each other because from here on out, it's going to be very important. Enrique was from Esparta, California, and Elijah lived in Woodland, California. And they both were currently on probation for being in the same fight. Now, I'm not sure if they had known each other for a long period of time. Even the parents weren't really sure how close these two boys were. And on top of that, they both went to the Cesar Chavez Community School in Woodland, California, and they both were in a very special program at this school. They both enrolled in a work program through their school. This work program was only for young adults that were on probation, um, struggling in that sort of way, and they actually had to go through a whole interview process in order to be accepted into the program, and the program is really small with only 13 to 15 students in it at a time. And with this program, you would go to school and the morning for four hours and then from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. every single day they would go to the fairgrounds in Woodland to participate in the Northern California construction training program so that was who they technically worked for it taught carpentry skills it taught life skills gave them an opportunity to do something productive, they made their own money, got their own paycheck, and they both really enjoyed it. And since they were one of very few students, I'm sure they had a lot of close contact with each other during this time frame. Now, I'm not sure if they knew each other before that school year started and before they went into this program together. I'm assuming probably since I saw that they both got into the same fight and that's why they both were on probation. But since school usually starts in mid-August, 
and Enrique disappeared in October, they only had a few months of being in this work training program. But during the entire time, they both said how much they absolutely loved it. They thought it was so cool that they got to go to school for a little bit and then got to go and actually have a job. A lot of young adults do not really have that opportunity and everything seemed to be going well. The program seemed to be doing exactly what it was meant for, which was helping these young adults stay out of trouble, keeping them off of the streets, doing illegal activity, teaching them to be responsible, and it seemed to be doing what it was supposed to be. So that morning when Enrique's mother, Lola, woke up, she was very concerned when Enrique wasn't in his room. They had a very particular routine. He, she would wake him up in the morning, wake up his little sister, get them both together and dressed and ready, and then it, it drop both of them off at their respective schools or areas that they were going to be that day. However, it was very important that Enrique be ready in the morning because one of the requirements was that he showed up to school in his work uniform and this program was linked with his probation officer so everything was pretty strict and went by a very strict set of rules. So when she realized that his work uniform was still there, she was a little bit concerned. So she called him, texted him, and finally around 7 in the morning he texted his mother back and said, Hey, I decided last night to go to a friend's house. I accidentally fell asleep here. I'm just waking up but I'm heading to school now and I'm fine. But she brought up the work clothes and that he didn't have them and how concerned she was that this would somehow affect the program. He then said that the person he was with had an extra set he could borrow. So since the program was so small, like I said 13 to 15 people, his mother assumed that the person he went to see the night before must have been another person in the program because that would be the only other person that would have the same work outfit as he would. He confirmed to his mom that he had stayed with another student in the work program and she expected him to show up to school that day. Just to be safe, she decided to call his probation officer, inform him of the situation, and he said to check back later on in the day to make sure Enrique showed up for school. Later on when she checked back in, she found out that Enrique had never shown up to school, but every single other person in the program had. Meaning if he had stayed at the house of someone who was in the work program, that person showed up, but for some reason he didn't even though he claimed they were both on the way to school together. She kind of figured he was just being a little bit rebellious. Enrique had run away before, stayed away a few days, so she thought it was possible he was just kind of doing his own thing for a little bit. And then by the time night came and he never showed up back home, she actually started to get a little bit angry and was texting him, you better get your butt home, where are you, this is unacceptable. You know, you have to keep in mind, he had been in trouble once, he was on probation, but for the entire length that he had been in school so far, this program seemed to be benefiting him a ton. Never showed up at home later that night, he never showed up the next day. A couple of very strange text messages were sent from Enrique to his mother Lola saying, I just needed some space, I'm too overwhelmed right now. Things that didn't really make sense and then he completely stopped responding and that's when she decided to file a missing persons report. At first, Enrique's case was treated like a runaway. After all, he had been on probation, he had run away before, he sent text messages to his mother saying that he just needed some space, everything pointed to him just kind of wandering off on his own. He was 16 years old so I would think that they maybe would have treated it a little bit more seriously but I guess with all of the information that they had gathered, they kind of just figured he was doing his own thing. His mother, however, knew he was not just a runaway and something was very wrong. At the time he went missing, it was pretty chilly in California. When she had last seen him, he had been wearing just a t-shirt and shorts. He was not dressed for the weather that was outside. However, he also didn't take anything else with him. The only thing he took were the clothes he had on the last time she saw him and his cell phone, wallet, ID, everything was left behind. He didn't even take a light jacket or think to switch pants or anything, which to her indicated he only planned to be outside for a minute and something must have happened to him. She went to his phone to look for clues and unfortunately, everything backfired on her. He had something on his phone that only allowed him to call a certain number of people. I'm guessing just important numbers like his mother, probably other family members, but he had his own way around that by an app that he used where he could message and talk and call to different people. However, that app I don't think recorded who he was calling. So Lola at this point had no way to know who exactly he had last spoken to. We all know that is so 
crucial. In situations like this, phones can lead to anything. We all have our phones usually most of the time. That could have been the last little clue to where Enrique was, but they had no access to it. His mom went to social media in hopes that someone would know something. After all, he had friends, people he talked to all the time. There was this tight-knit community feel in their group at school. So she assumed someone would come forward. However, everyone denied knowing anything. All of his friends that he spoke to on a daily basis, all of these people that he, you know, trusted, somehow had absolutely no idea where he was and had nothing to say about it. To add to the mystery to the whole entire situation, whenever his mom would post to social media, some young man named Marco would be tagged over and over and over again, not just by one person, but a lot of people. Yet when he was tagged, he never ever had a response. He would never go to the pictures, go to the statuses and respond to anything. He acted as if he never even got the notification to a lot of people screams guilt. Because the friends knew nothing and he was considered a runaway, Enrique's family had to do a lot of the initial work. They passed out missing posters everywhere, posted all over different social media sites. They really tried to get the attention of anyone they possibly could. They went to police to ask if they would at least reach out to the media and the police informed them that they would. Because like we've said before, media is one of the best ways to get out information on a case, the best way to spread things the fastest, and usually gives you the largest chance of bringing your loved one home. Police then contacted her back and said they had reached out to a media station and hopefully his picture and a bit of his story would be released sometime soon. But time came and went and there was still no coverage whatsoever on Enrique. I don't know if it's this way everywhere, but at least in the area they were in California, police have to go to media to allow them to broadcast anything about a missing persons report, about a murder, anything along those lines, the police have to give the news station an okay. And the police, even though they said they did, apparently never did because she was then contacted over Facebook by someone from a local news station saying she wished she could help, but without police's go ahead, she couldn't do anything. So from that standpoint, we can all safely assume that the police never actually reached out. This was absolutely devastating for Enrique's mother because again, we know the further away we get from the day the person went missing, the less likely it is we can bring them home. So this was absolutely heartbreaking. She was doing everything she possibly could, but alone she couldn't really do much more. Ola also knew something was very wrong because her son never just said something to her. If he had just run away, he would have been extremely embarrassed by seeing his pictures posted all over Facebook, all over Twitter, all over Instagram. She was posting his face everywhere daily begging for information and he was the kind of person that was so embarrassed over things like that and he would have called her and been like mom i'm fine you're embarrassing me please take all these posts down you're making a big deal out of nothing i just need some space so his original statement of i need space started to feel false when she realized he wasn't contacting her out of embarrassment. I add to that the fact that he took absolutely nothing with him and she knew that was a recipe for disaster. He also was absolutely in love with his little sister. She said their bond was absolutely inseparable. Even if he had something to do, even if he wanted to do something different, if she asked him to play, he stopped and he played with her. She was one of his favorite people in the entire world and there was absolutely no way he would leave her without him. So now we're going to talk about Elijah Moore and how both of these cases are connected. Elijah was 17 years old the last time he was seen, not even a month later on November 4th of 2016. He was last seen at a check cashing station in Woodland. He had just received his paycheck from his work program and he had also just spoken to his mother on the phone. It was only one day after his 17th birthday, he left the house that morning in good spirits and when he spoke to his mom on the phone, he also seemed completely fine. He was trying to cash his check and he had forgotten his social security number, so he called his mom, asked her what it was, they even joked around for a few minutes and then he said, I've got something to do and then I'm bringing the money back home. 
So she expected him to be home shortly, but unfortunately he never showed up. His mother called one of his friends that he was really close with, and this friend informed her that Elijah was supposed to meet him on his break, and he wasn't sure where he was, so he would call him himself and see if he could locate Elijah. Elijah's friend called him, but just like an Enrique situation, Elijah didn't answer the phone, but immediately responded back with a text. So literally verbatim what happened with Enrique and his mother. Elijah, however, did not send a normal text back to his friend. I am not 100% sure what exactly this text message said, but Elijah's friend immediately called Alicia back, his mother, and said, something's not quite right. This doesn't sound like Elijah. This isn't wording that he would use. Whoever just texted me this, isn't Elijah. Alicia then showed the message also to Elijah's older brother who he was incredibly close with and again his brother immediately knew something was wrong and that whoever had sent that text message was not Elijah. I feel like we all have our own little quirks when it comes to texting and talking and we all have different things that we say and I can usually tell who's texting me even if I don't have their number by the way they're speaking to me. So when I hear this I 100% believe it. Another text was then sent from his phone. I'm not 100% sure to who, but it said he was with a girl heading to the San Francisco Bay Area. And this was another big red flag to Alicia. She had family in the San Francisco Bay Area, and one of the only reasons he would have gone there would be to see his family. Yet none of them had been contacted by him, and that was completely out of character. Elijah was the biggest mama's boy, the biggest family guy. He looked up to his older brother like nobody else, and he was in love with his mom. They had such a great relationship. He would literally take his friends to go and hang out at her work with her because he just had such a great relationship and wanted to be with her at all times. They did everything together. They joked together. For him to just be missing for an extended period of time, which he also had never run away or even mentioned running away in his entire life was extremely out of character. Elijah's mom decided to go to the last place he was seen, which was at the check cashing place. And when she went there, she asked if she could go through any of the footage just to see if he was with anybody, see which way he went when he left. And unfortunately, they told her they couldn't give her anything without police's help. Now, just like the Enrique situation, Elijah was considered a runaway. Again, 17 year old on probation said he was going somewhere through text. That to police means runaway, which I completely understand. But again, I feel like parents knowledge of their own children should be taken a little bit more into consideration. One thing that the check cashing place did say was that Elijah was with another boy, a Hispanic boy, from the same work program. She cashed the same type of check. When she tried to get names, again, the check cashing place would not provide her with any information without law enforcement, so she started her own search for her son. Even though he was labeled as a runaway, she called and desperately asked police if they would check out this check cashing place, because again, the this was out of character to her. So they agreed, said they would look into everything. However, she went back a few days later to make sure they had gotten this information and unfortunately was informed by the employees there that police had never come to get it, which was absolutely devastating to her, just like it was devastating to Enrique's mom that they wouldn't contact the news stations because this could be her last little bit of information and last little bit of hope. And without the police helping, she had no way to get the information. She decided to track down on her own any possible leads she could, which meant friends, last people he had spoken to, areas he hung out a lot, and every single person she tracked down, every single one of his friends hadn't heard from him at all. No, he had his phone because he had texted people in the few days after he went missing, just like we know Enrique had his phone because he also only texted people for a few days after he was missing. But after those few days, both boys seemed to go completely ghost and no one had any sort of contact with them. His mother started passing out flyers occasionally and one time while she was out a woman came and stopped her and said that she had seen Elijah sitting on her front steps at 3 in the morning. She said she recognized him because he had asked her for cigarettes over and over and over again over the course of I think a couple of days. However, Elijah's mom doesn't think she's a very credible witness. There are different things about this woman that lead her to believe that she is just making this up. We're not in the right state of mind to have any knowledge of Elijah or recognizing him. 
So I just wanted to throw that in there just in case, but I also don't think it really is a credible source. Alicia knew for a fact though that Elijah did not run off, just like Lola knew for a fact Enrique wouldn't have run off. Elijah was over six feet tall and over 200 pounds and knew martial arts. She said that nobody could take him down alone. She said he was a very gentle person, but when you made him angry or threatened him, he could get very aggressive very fast. So if someone had approached him and unwillingly tried to take him or force him off, he would have taken them down in seconds. That immediately led her to believe, along with Enrique's mother to believe, that both boys had been taken by the same person that somehow managed to gain their trust. For a long time, police denied any sort of connection in the case. You know, it's very possible these boys had a troubled past that they just ran off. It might not be connected, it might be connected, but to the police it was very possible they just decided to get the heck out of Dodge and do their own thing. But then finally the FBI came forward and they said, we 100% believe that these cases are connected. And this was a huge step in finding Enrique and Elijah. Enrique's last communication was about a year ago, a brief text message about needing a break. Weeks later, his friend Elijah Moore disappeared too. Last year on surveillance video, a California check cashing here in Woodland. The students went to school together at Cesar Chavez Community School. Initially, they were considered runaways. Investigators later changed their thinking, now saying that their cases are suspicious and they could be linked. Enrique's mother says she has no idea where her son might be or how he disappeared. I mean, a year ago today, I was saying goodnight to my son, and then the next day he was gone. So I just want everybody to know he's still missing and that we still are looking for him, and he's important, and we want him home. The FBI is investigating this case. They have offered $10,000 for the return of both boys. Enrique's mother tells us that he, she has heard little from investigators about where her son might be and any possible leads about who may have him. They finally got the surveillance footage, and the surveillance footage unfortunately didn't really show anything. Lisa was told that he was seen with a Hispanic boy from the same work program. However, when I looked at the footage, which I will include in this video, you can see he is pretty much by himself unless someone was waiting further back in line or maybe waiting for him outside or had already gone through before him. But if you look at the footage, he seems completely fine, and he seems to be walking in alone. He goes up to the counter, pulls something out of his book bag, puts it back in, and then heads out. New video from the FBI of one of the Yolo County teens who vanished in late 2016. In the video, 17-year-old Elijah Moore is seen on security camera at the California check cashing location on Main Street in Woodland. You can see him in the video wearing a black hoodie with a green backpack. These are the last images of Moore before he vanished. Now both families and the FBI are hoping that this video might help to bring their boys home. And we're not asking anyone to feel as though they're snitching. We're asking people to talk because we need their help. Now, the FBI says someone can remain anonymous and still provide the FBI with information that it needs. They are offering $5,000 for information leading to one boy, $10,000 for information leading to both boys. His mother, he didn't seem upset or in any sort of distress while they were on the phone together. He was joking around, acting his normal self. He didn't appear to be in any sort of distress in the video either, like someone was forcing him to go in there and cash this money or forcing him to do this or forcing him to do that. So at this point, they again had really nothing. The FBI tried to ping Enrique's phone, but there was no activity, and then they tried to ping Elijah's phone, and they found something a little bit interesting. When Elijah left the checks cashing place, he appeared to be heading in the same direction as home. However, when they pinged his phone, he had left Woodland completely and gone somewhere else outside of Woodland. He was still in Yolo County, which is the county that Woodland and Esparta is in. But then he was pinged back again in Woodland later on near Knight's Landing community, which was, I'm pretty sure, about a 30 minute drive from the checks cashing place. And if I am correct, I don't think either of them had a vehicle, um, but I am not 100% on that, which means he either took public transportation or he was with someone else. And I do know he was supposed to meet that friend. However, he never met with that friend, so no one really knows who he was with why he would have left Woodland and then why he would have come back to Knight's Landing and then go missing from there.
Elijah's mother has since held many vigils in Knight's Landing. She has gone around the last places he was seen with posters, candy, cigarettes, soda, anything she possibly can to give to people to start a conversation and to maybe get a little bit of information out of them. But unfortunately, no one claims to have seen him or know anything about his disappearance. According to police, they have interviewed dozens of people. They have served multiple, multiple warrants. They've also seized many items of potential evidence that are being analyzed in the FBI lab in Virginia. However, I am not sure if there are any results back yet. I'm also not sure where they got any of this information. Again, to not compromise their case, and we all know how the FBI works at this point, they keep everything very tight-lipped to make sure their investigation is kept tight and ready to go and they can charge people when necessary, which I completely understand, but they are now keeping any other information to themselves. So, so I have no idea what warrants were served. They interviewed so many people, so I'm wondering who these people were, were they maybe fellow students in this program, but they said dozens of people, there were only 13 to 15 people in that program. So this brings us on to another case that might possibly be related. And I just wanna throw this in there real quick because there's potential, FBI I don't think connected this, I just find it very odd. A year later, on January 6, 2017, 26-year-old Oscar Alcarez went missing. And interestingly enough, he was in the adult program of the Northern California Construction Training Center that they had out at the fairgrounds. Now, no one's really sure and no one will confirm if the adults and the youth are kept separate, but they are both there at the same time. So this man did great in this program. He was doing awesome. He was helping his parents out on a farm. His parents had a few medical issues and he was really stepping up to the bat and turning his life around. However, one day out of the middle of nowhere, they had some sort of argument. He went to walk around the orchard that was located on their property and then completely went missing. He was apparently found a month and a half later, very, very close to Woodland, California, off of a highway that also just so happened to be right off of the area where the checks cashing place was and where the fairgrounds was. He was found face down in a field deceased with a random car stuck in the mud near him and as far as I know they haven't solved this case yet. Obviously this was the third person in a little over a year to go missing from the same program that wasn't a large program. No one at this point that I know of knows what exactly happened to Oscar, but I wanted to add it in there because a lot of people do think it could be related. So this brings us to the theories. So both mothers think someone gained their son's trust and led them into a situation they thought would be fine and then somehow completely snatched them and took them away against their will. Again, Enrique had run away before, but the situation's not really set up like a runaway. He, he left his wallet and everything important to him behind. It was freezing cold outside and he left in a shirt, just a regular t-shirt and shorts. He didn't even change pants real quick or throw a jacket on real quick. You know, something you would need if you were planning on running off. He kind of left the house as if he was planning to go out for a minute and then unfortunately never came back. If he was planning on going to his friend's house, like he told his mom, wouldn't he at least take his wallet, um, at least his ID? You would think, you know, he maybe would have put warmer clothes on, would have taken his work clothes with him, but instead he just left everything behind. To me, it seems like someone was meeting him outside in their car real quick. He knew he was just gonna run out, hop in a warm car for a minute and then come back in. Maybe he was meeting someone to talk to them. Maybe he was lured in by a female. I'm not really sure, but to me, I don't think he just ran away. He also had really nothing to be overwhelmed about in the moment. He said he felt a lot of pressure in his text messages that no one at this point believes were sent by him. He was doing great. He was earning money. He was able to buy his own things. He was really starting to grow as a person and was doing great in school, got great grades. So for him to feel overwhelmed just seemed a little bit off because he was probably at 
one of his best points in life so far, as a teenager at least. Elijah is the exact same. I don't think he would have run away. He was best friends with his mother, best friends with his older brother. He really was in love with his family. He had never even threatened to run away before. This was something completely out of character for him. And his mother spoke to him right at the last time he was seen, and he didn't seem anxious. You know, for a young teenager who was planning on running off, I would assume speaking to your mother would kind of make you a little bit anxious, especially for someone who has never done it before. The fact that he was a very calm and his misdemeanor was completely normal on the phone raises a lot of red flags for me, that he didn't have anything planned afterwards other than going home like he said he was. I find it strange as well that he did say on the phone though that he had to go do something. Maybe he was going to meet someone real quick, just like it's possible Enrique went to do. That's why he didn't seem upset or weird. Obviously, he never went to go meet with his friend on break, so maybe he met with someone in between then. The only thing that I find strange about this are the different pings on his phone. If someone snatched him and took him somewhere, why would they take him from Woodland, outside of Woodland, and then back in Woodland, and then he would just disappear. There's also a theory that they both kind of planned this together and disappeared at different times, and this is mainly based off the fact that Enrique ran off first. Enrique, again, had history of running away before, so people think he might have planned to run off first and then Elijah would soon join him. They had been making money, they possibly could have been saving that money, however, it is also likely that their parents were in control of that money, but if not, they took their checks to a check cashing place that gave them cash back. That's really easy to leave no paper trail. They could easily save all this cash up and then run off and not be seen for a long time. However, again, if this was planned, I feel like Enrique would have packed more things to go along with him, but he just didn't. And again, if it was planned, I would assume Elijah would be very nervous considering this was not something that he normally would have done, but he didn't appear to be that way. At this point, everyone has pretty much come to the conclusion that something very wrong happened to them. You know, if they were in this work program and they did have any sort of contact with the adults in the program, it is possible that the adults' offenses and reasons why they were on probation were linked to many, many scary things. It could possibly be gangs, drugs, you know, a lot of different areas where, you know, they could possibly take advantage of these young men. It's possible that they befriended one of these men and the program. It's possible that one of these men saw them as great targets. You have to think about it this way. If this has anything to do with human trafficking or, you know, gang related, these young men were the perfect ones to target. I don't mean this in any sort of disrespectful way, but you think about how police handle A, minorities, and B, people with any sort of criminal history, and usually it's just pushed to the side. So what better people to choose to target than young men, both in minorities, that have a criminal history? No, they went straight home after school, they hung out with their family, the only real place they would have come into contact with someone would have probably been at school or in this work program. Obviously, Enrique wasn't with anyone that night from his work program because everyone else showed up. And I would figure if he was innocently with another friend, that other friend probably would have come forward and said that by now, but from my knowledge, no one claims to have spent the night with him that night, unless that person is in on something as well. I don't think any of the text messages were actually sent from these young men. They both had text messages sent within the first couple of days that they went missing, very vague, talking in a way that they wouldn't normally speak. To me, it seemed like someone wanted to get the parents off of their backs, pretty much wanted to brush everything to the side like they had just run away, so hopefully it would be ignored. If you guys have seen Enrique or Elijah or know anything, please contact any of the information I have linked down below. Elijah's mother has said it before, it is a very small, tight-knit community in the Woodland area and everyone knows everything, and the fact that not a single tip has come in, not a single person has come forward saying they know anything is not normal and to me that does not say anything good at all. Let me know what you guys think down below. I'm really interested to see what you guys have to say. I think there's way too many commonalities in all of these and I think something very strange is going on. The further I looked into Yolo County in general, the amount of bizarre 
missing persons and Jane and John Doe's that occur in that county is absolutely horrifying. It's where Sherry Papini showed back up when she had been originally taken and then found. It's just bizarre the things that happen in that county and I think there are some not so great things involved. There's a lot of information on their Facebook page and theories, things that the parents think. There's something right now going on with a house that had previously had some issues with it, something to do with possibly bodies being found there. I have no idea. It is such a deep and strange, strange case and the deeper you dig the more bizarre things get. So if you guys want to support either of their cases in any way, shape, Perform. You can either go and donate to their GoFundMe down below or if you would like I am doing my limited edition merch and you guys can get a t-shirt from me and also help benefit a good cause. I will be giving all proceeds to them and Epistepic. So on that note guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Bye.